Jorginho Frelo, the player that divides opinion the most within the Chelsea community. This is Jorginho's player profile. And to present Jorginho's profile with me is none other but my friend and brother, Amea. Amea, welcome back to Chelsea Perspective. Yep, it's amazing to be back. And uh, yep, let's let's get straight into it. I think I'm very excited to talk about this player because I remember texting you and saying I like to play with fire. And uh, you know, let's see. Hopefully, I don't offend too many too many of his fanboys per se on Twitter. Well, we have to be objective here. Yeah. So, <laughs> if anybody takes offense, apologies in advance. But we have to, you know say it as it is and uh, again more importantly it's always a pleasure to talk football with you uh you know your stuff and that's why i i always you know push you try to get you to come onto the channel and i'm happy you're here with me right now so i may let's start with his uh history can you take some time and give us an overview a brief overview of of his history, the clubs he's played for, and how he got to Chelsea. Yeah, I mean, actually, I did know it briefly before, but then he recently, you know, dropped an article for the Players Tribune, uh, and you know, I I went through that, and it was honestly such a wonderful story. It made me love him just that much more. I mean, already he's turning out to be one of my favorite players in the squad, and. And, you know, that story just, it, it really melted my heart the way that it, it, it was written. I mean, he was, uh, you know, in one of the academies in Brazil. That's where he was born. And then, um, you know, he moved to Italy at the age of 15 or, or 16. I think it was around that age. And he had to stay there alone. And he lived there on 20 euros a week because that's what his agent gave him. And, you know, at one point he couldn't, he, he just he just felt he couldn't do it anymore. And then he called his mom and dad and, and said, you know what, I'm coming back. And then his mom said, if you come back, I'm going to lock the doors and not let you inside. Because you, this is your dream. You're gonna have to pursue it yourself. And and apparently, his sister told him that his mom cried later after telling him that. But you know, she stood there strong for him and and told him that. And apparently, his mother was his inspiration, who was a football player. So that's another surprise. And you know, some some great motivation there probably. But I mean, then he he went on for Hellas Verona. That's where he started his career. And then he went to Empoli and then Napoli and then finally ended up at Chelsea. So honestly, it's a it's a fantastic trajectory. And um, I mean, you know, fair play to him <laughs> in all honesty. Yeah, because he is now one yeah, of the I best players to, in the world. <laughs> yeah, I have to agree. It is a, a, a fantastic trajectory, like you said, and a touching story at that because given that he almost gave up, and it took yep. his mom's encouragement to keep him going. And that's good to see. And I think it's a lesson for all of us that uh, just keep pushing for whatever you want in life. If you don't give up at the time, it will things will fall into place and you will get exactly what you want for yourself. And that's good to know. Um, and, and I'm happy that he's come this far. He's achieved a lot as a footballer and he's... You can say he's had uh, so much success. It it will be correct to put it that way. Uh, but that's that's. Uh, by the way, uh, I may. Uh, let's talk about his current form. Uh, can you please over to you, I may uh, talk about his current form. Tell us how. I mean, how well he's doing at this point for I mean, the club, he... his country, also. He just won two of the biggest European prizes and then went on to win the UFA Player of the Year as well. So, I mean, what more can you say about him? He's been in excellent form, especially since Tuchel took over in January. I know I know, we'll talk about that later, but uh, you know, since Tuchel took over in January, he's been one of our best players. He's got a system around him that suits his style of play. So, he's really been excellent. And although at times he does seem a little bit shaky, especially that Liverpool game, I thought the first half he was actually a little bit shaky, losing the ball here and there, trying to get go down for fouls but the second half proved it that proved that why why we all love him so much because the, the, he just reads the game so well and although his physicality doesn't support him he's always there in the right place at the right time to intercept right before the opposition even plays the pass so that's one of his biggest strengths and and his current form has actually uh, been really good i would say especially the, with the system that's suited to him for italy as well as for for chelsea 
Yeah, I'd have to agree. He's been brilliant uh, from the Euros to the start of the season, uh, the UEFA Champions League final. I mean, he's not perfect, but you could say overall he's been brilliant for both club and, and country. But that's, by the way, I may Let's go into his abilities. What are his abilities, his technical abilities and otherwise? Can you please take some time and give us an overview of that as well? Yeah, of course, of course. I think his role has actually changed uh, slightly uh, under all three managers. He was, of course, signed by Sari, and then at Sari, he was mainly used as a register, and he was he used to be the deepest in a midfield three, which was uh, Kante on his right and Loftus Cheek or Kovacic or Barkley or whoever on on his left. And under Lampard, he was mainly used in double pivot, but with four at the back, right? And then now under Thomas Tuchel, it's the three five. Or the 343 system or the 3421, however you want to. I mean, I'm pretty sure even Tuchel doesn't uh, explain it properly, right? It's just your positions at the pitch. But so uh, I think right now he plays in a pivot, usually with Kante or Kovacic if, if Kante is, in a, uh, is not available. And that suits him uh, very much. I think his strengths basically are his ability to read the game, which I think is one of the best in the world honestly i'm i'm i mean uh, if you look at his physicality you wouldn't think that he would be a defensive midfielder although he's not technically a defensive midfielder but his ability to read the game pits him amongst one of the best and he he ranks in the 90th percentile among midfielders for interceptions in europe so you know that he is top class when it comes to reading the game and then his quick passing is pretty good as well you know he controls the tempo he he basically retains possession Really, really well. That's that's his biggest strength. I mean, if you give him the ball, you guarantee that it goes to another teammate and not to the opposition. So you're going to retain the ball. You're gonna he 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 can control the tempo of the game, decides when to pass or not, and he can also you know get himself out of pressure situations like we saw at the latter end of last season. Every time he gets pressed, he although he doesn't seem like you know the sort of silky midfielder that Kovacic is, the way he just simply turns around or, or makes a quick switch of play. Is is what you know makes him excellent, really, and those are his basically, uh, I would say, strong points. Uh, his his strengths, his um, you know, basically what we signed him for. Those are his marquee qualities, which he does better than most other midfielders in the world, if I dare say. Yeah, I'd have to agree that he's one of the best in terms of uh, helping a team keep the ball. And I mean, but. He's that kind of like category. He's in that category of plays. It's it's very difficult to understand what he does for a team, and that is especially true when you talk about the Chelsea fan base. And that's you could argue that's one of the reasons why he divides opinion very much uh, within the Chelsea community because only a few you'd have to have uh, you'd have to be able to see things, see football from the from a technical perspective to be able to tell. This is what this guy does for this team. And unfortunately for him, most people are not able to see that. So, uh, Amir, um, now let's move on. Um, I see you like the guy so much. Uh, maybe you just started loving him uh, off recent. But um, I'd like you to please put aside how much you like him and how how great he's been uh, uh, in recent weeks uh, more. So if you like, and, and tell us what, has, what are uh, Jorginho's weaknesses? Yep, I mean, there are a fair few, and I have to say, because especially that came out under Lampard, because he wanted a more robust sort of CDM, which is where we're linked to Declan Rice. He wanted, uh, you know, not uh, someone who does the fancy stuff, but he just wanted someone who does the basics, right, because of, of how Lampard's system was. But Jorginho isn't that type of guy, right? So an obvious weakness is his physicality. Now, I'm, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Right? Some people actually blow it out of proportion. They just want, you know, bulky, tall, fast players over technical players regardless of their ability to read the game and whatnot so I don't agree with those guys but I mean the mere fact that Jorginho himself said this he said that uh, you know because I wasn't tall strong or fast like the other guys I had to develop my IQ right so I he plays with his mind and uh, so that's one of the reasons but his physicality is an obvious weakness I think um, he also goes down too easily for fouls especially this season with the rule changes right the referees are told to keep the game flowing so we did see him be a victim of that, especially against Liverpool a couple of times. He went down, but the referee said that it's not a foul. And uh -huh. um, and at times, sometimes he just gets 
overwhelmed i would say he's a confidence player right if he's if he has the confidence and you can see him pinging passes everywhere but at the same time if he's low on confidence he might even misplace the most simple passes because like you i think under lampard you could clearly see that uh, he was misplacing passes he wasn't that uh, that great i mean no disrespect but it is what it is right you, you have to call a spade a spade he was low on confidence he was being benched as well so he wasn't at his best there although he was the vice captain of the club he wasn't at at his best there but then under tuchel you can see his confidence in if, if the crystal palace game actually i thought you know although there were a lot of star players in our first game of the season jorginho was excellent i mean i was seeing him ping passes switching play with his left boot i've rarely seen him do that before and it used to be inch perfect too so he's a confidence player so at times you can see him lacking and um i mean i don't know if i can really say this but he's not exactly a goal scorer as well i mean i know that he was a top goal scorer in the league but all of that was for pen- penalties right last season so he's not someone that takes a lot of shots on and he's not that type of player but if you compare him to say a normal dm like right I- I mean, you look at the midfielders that we've had at Chelsea over the years: Makélélé, Essien, Lampard, Balak, and Jorginho doesn't fit that category exactly. He is the sort of midfielder who, who's, um, you know, who's technical, but at the same time, he doesn't necessarily get assists like Fabregas as well, which is why, like you said, he gets slandered by a lot of people and and he divides the fan base. But you know, he has the strengths, but like I mentioned, he has his fair few weaknesses as well, which is why. you know under thomas tuchel system we have to concentrate on his strengths and try and minimize his weaknesses which which you know no player is actually free from but these are jorginho's weaknesses the the stuff that i just mentioned yeah i think you hit you hit the nail right right on the head whereas is is capable of helping a team keep uh, keep the ball rip the game control the tempo of the game i think in terms of getting goals for a team i think he lacks in that area and, and that that's um he lacks also he he his shooting is also woeful i know he's uh, at the same level in terms of shooting with coverage in and uh he doesn't create too many chances um first at uh, first uh, i think on the sorry i i at first i argued that maybe it was the striker's fault that he created some chances that and the strikers don't put away the chances but as he stayed uh, at uh, the more, that is uh, uh, after Sarri's departure on the Frank Lampard and also uh, Thomas Tuchel, it, it, it occurred to me that no, he doesn't create too many chances. And that's something our midfielders lack a lot. Yes, like you've mentioned, he's our highest goal scorer this past season. But the, those goals are all from the penalty spot. He didn't score any goal from an uh, open play and... Yeah, that's something. Uh, if possible, I don't know if it is something that can change at his age right now. If, if it is something that can change, I'd like to see him improve on uh, at least in the area of creating more chances because we need that. We need somebody who will look up and see some when uh, one of if his teammates makes a run into the box, he should be able to see that as soon as possible and not waste time on the ball. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but. Um, That's by the way uh I may uh... So now would you say he's improved and, and and if the answer is yes how has he improved left for me I'd say I I, I haven't net noticed any improvement all I would, I'd say is that uh, he he had a period where he wasn't on form but at the time he regained his form that's all I'd say I wouldn't say he's improved his game in any way but maybe you you know we all see things differently maybe you've seen areas of his game that has improved if that's the case please let us know yep like you said right more than improvement it's about giving him uh, you know the tools basically right that's what thomas tuchel's done and that's why he's such an integral part of our system uh, you know especially in the 343 system that we currently play it's because he's been given that freedom he's you know initially under sari he was the deepest lying midfielder i know in the serie a you don't have as many defensive duties but in the premier league right, the way most of the teams play like every bottom half team is a team that plays on the counter more or less right i, I think we can agree on that and mm-hmm. and you could see him often get caught out in transition his lack of pace and his lack of physicality didn't help him in that sense under lampard as well in in a double pivot with just four at the back it didn't help him but under tuchel right he's been given that defensive cover so that even if he does falter at times you know that you have defenders behind you to try and take care of the situation in transition so it's more about him being given the tools to express himself but at the same time i think it, uh, he's improved as 
well in, in, in some sense. I think his passing has improved, his long passing. Initially, you could see that uh, he prefers to play, play short passes even now. But I think he sometimes, especially in these past few games, he's been more adventurous. He's been, uh, he's actually passing the ball a lot quicker. I remember uh, a couple of seasons back, he used to dwell on the ball for way too long, waiting for movement around him. So now I don't know if that's particularly the players actually understanding that and making the movement themselves or if he's, or if it's just him releasing the ball quicker, but he releases the ball quicker. He's become more adventurous with his passing. He's started using his left uh, left boot as well. And yeah, I would say that's about it. And uh, I mean, his interceptions bit was always there, in my opinion. I think uh, all, all the past two seasons, Champions League and even the Euros, actually, he's been absolutely incredible at reading the game all these, all, all these years. But uh, I think, yep, those are the two things that I would like to say. He's releasing the ball quicker. I think he's understood the Premier League a lot better now. And, um, and yep, I think, uh, I think there has been some, some improvement from him too, uh, more than just being given the ability to express himself by Thomas Tuchel. I, I think I would, I would have to agree with you that, yes, there's been some measure of improvement uh, from him because uh, I, I think looking at it, actually, I think he makes more inter- interceptions these days than he usually does. And truthfully, uh, uh, it, it's not easy to transition from being a register to playing in a double pivot where basically you have some defensive responsibilities because registers usually is just to help the team control the tempo of the game, keep the ball, uh, connect the defense with the midfield and attack. But I think he's adapted very well uh, to the changes of playing, uh, being paired with somebody else. And it's not just about him. Uh, yeah, let, I mean, I, I give him credit on that. I think he's he's improved to to an extent. And thank you very much for making me realize that. I sincerely do appreciate that. So now, um, Amaya, over to the next question. Usually, uh, there's always some argument that um, a, a certain player will uh, that is a certain player is more suitable to a certain from uh, for a certain formation, something like that. Yeah, there's like there, for instance, there are arguments that you'd have to change the formation to some like uh four three three to get the best out of players like Ziyech and uh Christian Pulisic and Callum Hudson Hudson Odoi and the others. Uh when it comes to Jujinho, do you think he's more suitable for any formation or do you think he's able to play in, in any formation that took uh you know the sides to or uh, to play? I think this is a very, very tough one, but I think I'm going to have to go that he is not probably suited to other formations. I think, especially this one system, right? I actually was under the, the impression that we might try and experiment with the 4-3-3 this season, but with the signings that we've made, I think, uh, especially Saul coming in, I think it, it points to us continuing with the 3-5-2 formation for the rest of the season. Um, um, but I think... Um, Fair enough. I mean, it's working for us at the moment, so I don't see, you know, why change something that works. Uh, I think that's what I would like to say. But Jorginho, in other systems, I think he could, he does run the risk of getting, you know, caught out on the counter, and it's not his fault, right? I I I, I keep on trying to reiterate this. I'm not slandering him. I just. Uh, you know, he, it, it, it's no secret that he's not the most physical. It's no secret that he's not the fastest player. So if there is a fast player in on transition and, and he's making the run past Eugenio, you wouldn't expect him to track back along with him or, or expect him to, you know, bring him down because that's not the sort of player that he is. So um, in other systems, I think, especially in a 4-3-3, uh, and, and in Sari's first season, I, I, he wasn't bad, but then at the same time, you could see that he was struggling at times, which is why he was made scapegoat for most of our losses as well uh, in the in that Sari season. So I would say other systems, yes, he can perform because at Italy, uh, he's been playing in a four three three under Roberto Mancini, right? And he was one of Italy's best players in the entire tournament at Euro. So can he play that? Yes, but he needs that movement. And and honestly, international football is different to Premier League football. So I would say. Um, as much as I love Jorginho, I, I would think that this system probably masks his, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I, I, I don't know the right word to use here because I don't want to sound offensive. But no, I, get, I, get, I think I understand your point now because the truth is, like you did mention, he was being scapegoat on, uh, scapegoated on the uh, Maurice Sarri's reign. Uh, but uh, 
I, I've, uh, something I observed is this. I think he seemed, he seemed to perform well when you pair him with another player who's yeah. defensively sound. Exactly. And although he has an almost telepathic connection with um, Kovacic, but when you play them both, there are some measure of sacrifice defensively <laughs> because they're both not, none of them, none of the two is, is a definite defensive midfielder. So you see the best of Jorginho when you pair him with Kante because he's well protected. Yep. So I think, um, yeah, I'd say formation really isn't really, uh, um, it doesn't matter how we, whatever, it doesn't matter the formation we play. What matters is the structure of the midfield itself. If you pair him with somebody, especially somebody who's defensively sound, then you'd see the best of Jorginho. Even games where you don't pair him with somebody with, who's defensively sound, he, you'd see the, his best. But when he is pressured, he gets exposed because he doesn't have that protection, although he reads the game. But because he lacks, lacks the physicality, uh, uh, in most cases, he just gets uh, notched off the ball or something like that. Like uh, you did mention uh, during our last game or so, he was looking for the foul, but the referee yeah. has been told to let the game flow and he didn't get the foul. So, yeah, but uh, that's, by the way, I, may, uh, I know we've talked about uh, to, to some measure what he brings to the team, but overall, to put things together, how would you explain to the Chelsea fan base or a Chelsea fan who doesn't really understand what Jorginho does to the team, his importance to the team. So how would you explain to them how that is what Jorginho brings to the Chelsea team? I mean, you remove him from the team and you see what you get. I think that's what I like to say, right? So many times we've seen... I know that Kovacic is more than a capable, uh, capable substitute for him, but at the same time, the way Jorginho plays, right? The way that he reads the game, the way that... Even executing, uh, you know, the manager's instructions. Actually, I forgot to mention this in, in, in one of his strengths. Even Tukil himself has come out and said this. The way... That, I mean, you tell Jorginho your plan for the game and he will make sure that it gets executed, right? You see him always pointing... And not only when he has the ball, when you, you see when the defenders are in possession of the ball as well, he points and tells them where to pass, right? So that is a very important attribute of his as well to carry out the instructions. And, you know, he's one of our more experienced players in the squad as well. So he provides leadership. We've seen so many players come out and say that Jorginho is such a good dressing room personality. Uh, you know, although he's experienced, he he leads by example as well. So we've seen that Jorginho has a few intangibles. We've seen that he, uh, you know, basically he controls the tempo of the game, right? As much as, you know, how much ever of an orthodox football fan you are, you cannot deny that Chelsea look better on the ball when Jorginho is on the pitch, right? I know that although he does have his defensive frailties, but in possession, Jorginho is like, probably one of the best midfielders in the world to have uh, in case you are a possession-based team. And that's what he offers. I mean, although it's an underrated attribute, in my opinion, because purely, especially in the Premier League, it's all about kicking the ball forward and you know putting it into the back of the net. But that's not what Jorginho is. He's that tactical mastermind. He's the guy that... You know, although you think he doesn't do much, it's, you know, he does the basics very well and he's not flashy or, or you know, he doesn't attempt those fantastic passes, but because he does the simple stuff right and, and that simple stuff doesn't always necessarily contribute in terms of goals or assists for him. It doesn't mean that he doesn't contribute anything to the team. I think every, you know, the, the, the way the team presses as a whole, the way, uh, you know, he, he starts the moves as well, right? He picks out that one quick pass and then he instructs another player to make a run somewhere and then, you know, they pass there. So he is very integral to the way we build up, to the way we press. And the most important, of course, is to the way that we retain possession. Yeah, there's no denying on on uh, yeah on that aspect of his game. I think we've talked about it like four times <laughs> as the show as the show progressed. Uh, yeah, but that's by the way. I may uh, so given that we've signed our uh, uh, Saul Niguez, uh, do you think that will in any way affect uh, affect Jorginho's importance to the team or uh, and overall? Uh, how important will Jorginho be for the team uh, as, as the season progresses? 
I think he's going to be very, very important. I think once again, uh, the coming in of Saul is probably... I mean, he's not exactly a like-for-like backup for N'Golo Kante, but he is someone who is, you know, a workhorse, basically. He he likes to get up and down the pitch. He covers a lot of ground. He puts in the tackles. And in fact, I was looking it up and I was actually very surprised. He ranked sixth in tackles in the 2021 season, despite making just 32 appearances in La Liga. So he's someone who I think Tukil is going to use more as... A, a defensive sort of option. So I would still think that Jorginho or Kovacic are, are going to be uh, rotated in terms of game time when it comes to the midfielder who is in charge of you know keeping possession and, and driving the ball forward. And on the other hand, it's going to be uh, Kante or Saul who are going to be tasked with you know also contributing in attack, but mainly sort of looking over the defensive aspect. That's how I see it. So I don't think the coming of Saul will particularly impact Jorginho's game time directly, although it could indirectly because it's not it, now it's not Jorginho and Kovacic, it's Jorginho or Kovacic at times, if, if I can make that comparison. So um, the coming of Saul, I don't think is going to have too much of an impact. And I think Jorginho is going to continue to be be a very important figure for us this season too. And I, I can see him getting a lot of game time. And hopefully, hopefully, he could be the one that leads us to the Premier League title if, I, if I'm not jumping the gun. <laughs> So, so your argument basically is that uh, Saul isn't uh, a like for like with Jorginho. Is uh, he is more more or less a, a replacement, or uh, that is, you can say, a backup for N'Golo Ngo- Kante. Yep, I would. Yep, I mean, N'Golo Kante. I mean, I wouldn't say an entire replacement, but like we, it's no. You know, secret that Angola Kante has been having injury issues the past couple of seasons, right? And uh, at times we do look very thin, especially after learning out Billy Gilmore, right? We have just three midfielders for two spots and we're in six competitions. So we're going to have north of 60 games this season. I don't think three midfielders is going to cover that, which is why I think as and when Angola Kante is not fit for the game, I think we're going to see Saul Niguez fit in, instead of him. So I, I can't see, for example, I can't see a Saul and Kante playing together. I don't think that's going to work. I think it's going to be Jorginho or Kante on one side and N'Golo Kante, uh, sorry, Jorginho or Kovacic on one side and Saul or Kante on the other. That's how I see it. Personally, it, uh, that's just my opinion. No, I think it makes sense because uh, um, Kante and Saul will be, uh, I think will be uh, practically, I, I mean, you will be, how do I phrase it? I think it will affect the way we play because we need either Kovacic or Jorginho on the pitch so that we will be able to like facilitate our, our, our style of play. Uh, but now let's let's bring it back to the man that we're uh, well, that we're discussing his profile. Um, Amea, why do you think that Jorginho divides opinions so much within the Chelsea fan base? I touched upon this briefly a little bit earlier. It's because the Premier League, I mean, until, especially until Pep Guardiola or, or Jurgen Klopp came into the league, this was mainly an orthodox style of league, right? I mean, we still see the differences when we compare it to the other leagues. The Bundesliga is a team that, that where the teams usually concentrate on pressure. Serie A and La Liga are teams that concentrate in possession and tiki-taka and that sort of stuff. But the Premier League isn't like that. The Premier League, you know, especially you, you have sides like Burnley, you have sides like Newcastle, right? They aren't the sides where the manager tells the players, go out and express yourselves. It's all 10 if you sit behind the ball. The second we get a chance on the ball, you're going to hoof it forward and everyone, the pacey ones are going to run in behind. Or if you have a strong striker, he's going to hold up and then pass it to the pacey player who's running in behind. And, you know, so when you are used to this style of play, at, at, you're used to seeing the midfielders being you know, sort of robust, being strong, being you know physically commanding, and basically the only job of the of the defensive midfielder in that team is to win the ball back and kick it forward, right? But that's not what Jorginho does. He's not, although he reads the game really well. He's not the one you know to slug off players off the ball or something. He's the one who helps you retain possession. He's the one that helps start the attacks. He's the one that, you know, tells the team how to press. He's the one that helps the manager carry out the uh, the instructions. He's the one that helps ball progression. And I think Chelsea fans took some time to understand that. And another factor of this was because he was dubbed, you know, Sari's son. He was called as Sari's son because Sari signed him from Napoli and and they had such a strong bond when, when they were at the club. So 
I think all these factors sort of, uh, you know, made people hate Jorginho. And he wasn't, you know, one of the best players in the Lampard era either, right? So I would say all these factors sort of contributed to them hating on Jorginho. But then right now, I think he's won their trust back 100% because right after the Anfield game as well, I mean, I distinctly remember the away fans chanting Jorginho, Jorginho, and he went there and clapped for them. So, I mean, right now, he's definitely turning the fan base around. I think there is fewer and fewer people who are hating on him. And, uh, you know, let's see, hopefully by the end of the season, he is not a player that divides the fan base, but he is a player that is universally loved by the fan base. But I think you know, to answer your question in one brief sentence, it's because he is a different player to what people were usually used to seeing in the Premier League. And that took some getting used to. But then once people started realizing what he actually brings to the table, that's when people started, uh, you know, especially the Chelsea fan base, started appreciating what he does. Uh, that's a great, great response to that uh, question because uh, the stereotype on players who, you know, players who should be um, defensive midfielders is, I think that's, yeah, I think you hit the nail right, right on the head. That's the main reasons why there are some division in the Chelsea within the Chelsea fan base on on, on the importance of judging her to the team because um, if you look at all the defensive midfielders that played in the Premier League, it's either they are muscular or they are tall, big, or they are rough tacklers or, you know, you know aggressive, but that's yeah. not who Jorginho is. I think uh, I, I, that stereotype is probably, yeah, like you mentioned, it's one of the main reasons why uh, some people don't like um don't like him at all. You could, you could, I mean, you'd be right to put it that way, but that's... uh. By the way, and I'm, I think you would already, the next question I was going to ask was if you think that that has changed or mm -hmm. I think you already answered that. I think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they've changed their mind already given his recent uh, performance in recent months. He's won the European Footballer of the Year. He's won the Champions League with us. And it's not like he wasn't just a passenger on the pitch. He was pivotal throughout the whole game. He played very well in the Champions League final and in the Euros, he was great also. So that's good to see. Um, I mean, now let's, let's move on to his future. Uh, there's been uh, some, you know, gossip. Some say he's the one talking about how he wants to um, go back to Italy, which is some, which was something I think that was taken out of context. Every player you hear, every player say, Yes, at, at the point I'd like to. That, but usually that's the media. They, 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 the expert at, at you know just twisting stories and taking it out of context just to get more people read their articles or clickbait or something like that. And at the time, it sounded like it was true. I had to do a research to find out that there's nothing to. There's no substance to that story that he wants to leave. So uh, my question is this, do you think he has a future at Chelsea? Yeah, undoubtedly. I think there, there are some rumours. On the flip side, like you said, there's some rumours about him being offered a contract extension too. So we're going to have to see how that one pans out. But I think 100%, I think he's definitely going to stay. And, you know, if Aspilicueta does leave next season, his contract actually is expected, is supposed to expire in 2022. I don't know if he'll sign an extension, but he is now the vice captain of the club. So should Aspilicueta leave Chelsea at the end of next season that I would say he goes on to become the captain uh, because uh, that's how boldly I'm going to say this but uh, it's going to be interesting because mainly like, like you said right the going back to Italy and, and especially Napoli and, and that sort of stuff it was mainly his agent who always came out and said stuff like this uh, it, it was never Jorginho who you know although he he does openly love Napoli there's no there's no harm in that but it was mainly his agent who always came out and said that, you know, we'll see this transfer window, maybe next transfer window and stuff like that. It was never Jorginho who personally came out and said that I want to leave. So I would say he definitely does have a future at the club. I think he's probably due to sign a contract extension too. And, um, and you, you know, let's see because 100% he's going to be a key player for us this season. And um, let's see let's see what the following seasons bring. And, and you know, there's obviously you never know with Chelsea, right? It's such an institution. We don't even know what's going to happen. But I think as things stand, as of today, he is a very key, uh, and he's a very integral part of the system. So I would say he's definitely going to stay on, uh, stay on this season. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, I think those rumours, I, I think they don't make sense at all because the player himself, 
he's always confessed how much he loves uh, the club and how much he'd like to stay because if he wanted to leave, he would have left the moment Sari left Chelsea. Yep. And if he, yeah, and Sari could have he, is uh, you could argue could have convinced Juventus to come for him, and he would have left because there wasn't nothing there for him. He was he wasn't playing much games on the on the Frank Lampard at one point. I, I mean, it seemed as if he was done, but he came yeah. back stronger, especially under Thomas Tuchel. And he's been, uh, I mean, going from strength to strength ever since. And uh, that's good to see. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is the Gene Ho's player profile. And please get in the comment section below and let us know if we missed anything. And I may have coming back to you. Please take some time. I know I will put the complete information to our CFC chats in the comment section, but please Take some time and tell the viewers about CFC Chat uh, and the, or your own personal account, how they can reach you, and if you have anything coming on on CFC Chat. Yep. So um, thanks a lot for that, uh, Kusila. Of course, this is where I plug myself. Um, I mean, yep. So as Kusila actually said, I do have a channel called CFC Chat. So if you do, uh, I mean, if you did like what I had to say today and are interested to see more of me, I will be there. I'm co-host on that channel alongside Matt, and um, we've been making some big moves recently. We had Frank Carladon, and um, you know, we're on the road to 2K subscribers there. So if you do, if you guys are interested in helping us reach that milestone stone then do go out and subscribe and like and, and and follow all our streams we stream three times a week so um should be interesting and um yep i would like to see you there and of course my uh, personal twitter handle i think has, has does have it right there down below so if you guys are interested in reaching out to me following interacting i just love talking football with anyone so um if you did like what i have to say then then do reach out to me on twitter and and we can always have a chat and yep, that's about it from me. But I mean, I have to say, you guys have to like and subscribe to Chilla's channel as well because he's been working Thanks. so hard, so many new ideas. Honestly, you know, like such a creative mind. Like all we do is just streams, right? We just cover the news. But Chelsea perspective and Kuchilla, I mean, hats off to you for coming up with these great ideas and 100% deserve all your support, guys. So if you're watching this and haven't liked to subscribe, do do that and comment your thoughts down below too. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate you taking the time to say that, Amir. And ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the man. His Twitter handle is on the screen. And I urge you to go check out CFC Chats. And Amir himself, you, this is the second time you've seen him here. Even if it is your first time you've seen, he's very knowledgeable of the game, especially when it comes to Chelsea. And that's why I always strive to bring him back to Chelsea perspective. I love talking football with him. Again, please get in the comment section. Tell us your mind. Click on the uh, like button. Subscribe if you haven't. And more importantly, click on the bell notification button so you don't miss anything. Again, from me, Kuchila, and my brother, Amea, thanks very much for watching. See you guys next time. Cheers.